How do you know someone's an entrepreneur? What do you mean how? How do you know if someone's an entrepreneur? I think it's the way they speak. They'll, uh, they'll always overstate the number they make. Isn't it? Yeah. Always. <laughs>
just wash the suit and just dry it up and wear I'm going to keep interrupting. Yeah. Do you know how you know you're wrong? No. When you use the word, words like most and all. Anytime, anytime, anytime an investor hears an entrepreneur say most or all, we know you're making it up. <laughs> it's like saying some people. I don't know, where'd you get the number? Did you do an empirical analysis? Was it an online desktop? Did you stand on a traffic light and ask people, what's the number? Is it six out of 10? Is it four out of 10? Is it one out of five? What's the number? There's no such thing as all or most. Because if I were to build a business model on all or most, what is the series of assumptions I'm gonna put in? What is, what is the number for all or most or some? Okay, but I just, I, I wanna take you, like you and I have to go five steps back. Listen, you ever heard about the principle of first knowledge? An entrepreneur, make a note to that. The principle of first knowledge. So here's what the principle of first knowledge is. When you are trying to come up with any business concept, there is a series of knowledge that the person to whom you're selling the business concept must have. If they don't have it, they don't have the first knowledge to understand the knowledge that you're bringing, which is new. I'm going to explain it. Relax. If I said to you, you can trade Bitcoin on the internet in 1950. What would your answer have been? What is the internet? There's no first knowledge. So before I even understand trading and cryptos, I don't understand what the internet is. If I said to you, um, you can buy an electric car in 1800, what would your answer have been? What's electricity and what's a car? Do you get it? Yeah, so what you're doing, is you're jumping 15 steps forward and you're not taking the consumer with you. First, you're making the assumption the consumer knows what fabric they're buying. Most people don't know what fabric they're buying. They ask, does it look good or not? So when I buy the fabric, very few people actually check the composition of the fabric. They just buy the thing and get it tailored. Most people buy on cost, not on fabric. You're solving a problem that doesn't exist. <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah. Right. That, so that's the first thing I want to say to you. Then the second thing I want to say to you, which is probably more material. So Gil says, you not only have to understand that there's a gap in the market, but you have to make sure that there's a market in the gap. So here's what that means. If there are people who don't have shoes, and I say I'm going to make shoes for these people, well, it depends what type of shoe and who the people are and whether or not they have the money to buy the shoe I'm going to make. There's no point manufacturing Christian Louboutins with the Red Hills and then selling them in Malawi. The greatest of respect to Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. So they might have a number of shoes in the market problem, but the shoe has got to work for the space I'm in. Make sense? Yeah. This is a typical, uh, especially entrepreneurs in SA, you guys love making this mistake. You find a problem that people need, I don't know, a Toyota Corolla, and then you spend money building a Lamborghini. Then you go, but they said they need, no, they needed a Toyota Corolla. Why do you think businesses that typically do well are unsophisticated? It's down the road, you go to Blue Label Telecoms. What do they do? Sell airtime. It's <laughs> really complicated. What about Lofone? They'll sell you airtime and data. It's a very simple business. Does anyone know what is the third largest handset manufacturer in the world? Yes. What is it? Xiaomi. Xiaomi. What does Xiaomi do? In effect, they take Huawei and they just make it really, really simple, and they sell it in all of the poorest countries in the world. You don't know it because we don't really fit into the Xiaomi GDP uh, sort of model. But travel north of South Africa and you'll find Xiaomi phones all over the place. The best businesses are always, almost always, almost always simplest businesses that sell the most basic stuff. Stop building Lamborghinis. This morning I took my kids to a, a soccer thing. It was a, called Dads and Lads. So, uh, and by the way, the kids lost. The kids won. The fathers lost three-two to the kids. <laughs> and I actually worked out how the kids do it. The kids play huddle. They don't play soccer. So fathers strategically place ourselves and we pass the ball. The kids run to wherever the ball is. So every father that has a ball, the minute you get it, there are 15 kids around you. You have you have no hope, right? Um, 
Any, anyway, so I was with a lady this morning, and she says to me, she wanted to be here. She says, oh, I can't make it because of my son. I said, what do you do? She says, I sell weaves. I said, how's business? She said, tough. I said, why? I would have thought weaves is a great business. And then she explained to me the type of weave she sells. I said, yeah, but that's your problem. You, you know, she's based in Tembisa, and she's trying to sell Brazilian weaves at like 10,000 bucks. Now, I, I don't want to pass judgment on people from Tembisa. There are a few of them in the room. It ain't your fault. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you also have to make sure that the product fits the market. There's no point. If there's, a, if there's a gap in the market, there must be a market in the gap. Otherwise, these things don't work. Let's find, there was one other person with a business idea. You, sir, at the back, yeah. I'm going to create a create facility for people that uh, earn minimum to m basic rate of living um, to help them during the middle of the month so that they can buy groceries and all of those things. They cannot exchange it for cash. It must be used as a voucher or like a normal clothing account. Like won't work. Pay stuff. Next, next idea. <laughs> you want me to tell you why it won't work? You want to you wanna create a credit facility for consumers to buy basic foodstuffs in the middle of the month? Yeah? Yeah, so the South African law does not allow you to exchange credit by forms of goods. Credit has to be exchanged in the form of either a product, a single product if you are the manufacturer and retailer of that product, and or an actual physical amount. So that's the first reason it won't work. The second reason it won't work, which is probably more material, is the minute I've used something, it has no value. Okay. So if you allow me a credit facility to buy in Gomaz, the minute I've consumed it, I'm not going to pay you. It's gone. Make sense? If it would work, then you do know that ShopRite and Pick and Pay would have long since been offering facilities to customers to buy food middle of the month. Did you just say, damn? <laughs> <laughs> right? Next idea. I'm trying to build a real estate crowdfunding platform. Oh, dear. Real estate and crowdfunding. Next idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to you later. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, for clients that are looking for construction service providers. Um, so how it works is if you are... Before you tell me how it works, tell me the problem you're solving. The problem that we're solving is trying to bridge a gap for clients that are looking for construction services and contractors that are struggling to get clients. So how it works is if you are a client and you're looking for a construction service provider, you log on the system and you provide the description of the service that you're looking for. And these contractors will bid and compete for your job. Um, we've got suppliers as well. And we suppliers will make prescriptions in terms of the resources that they have available. Won't and work. Know how it won't work. No. Ask me why. I'm waiting for you to ask me why. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why, why won't it work? Yeah, it won't work because construction is an intimate project. People want to meet the person who's building. Construction is as much about the person and the credibility and trust I have in that person as it is about the quality and, co and cost of that work. To make it just about quality and cost, if that were the case, then you'd simply build an Uber, but for contractors. Well, basically, um, part of why we believe so much in it is because we run a construction, uh, construction company ourselves. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that are looking for construction service providers, but they don't know where to find them. And especially sure. construction service providers that are, that are more credible, affordable, or, uh, and competent yeah, so as well. Yeah, so here's what I would do. I think your business model is wrong. I think your idea is right. So what I would do if I was you, I'd simply build a, um, you know, TripAdvisor? I'd build a TripAdvisor, but for people in the construction trade. So it's a place you go that makes a series of recommendations on people based on other customer service levels. It's not about cost and it's not about convenience. It's about whether or not the person's going to get the job done and if other people verify the quality of their work. That's it. The business model then is very simple. You charge advertising revenue and you get as many people to come on the platform to look for building contractors as possible. Very simple. You don't, then, you, you don't, get, a, you don't get involved in the... Because what you're describing is then you have to get involved in the contracting, the origination. The, you don't want to be in that mess. That's not your business. If we meet and he's on your platform, and on your platform it says he's a five-star, a five-star, and I contract him and he's a, he does a two-star job, I go on your platform and I give him a two-star rating. Finished. That's all you want to do. By the way, let me, let me just say this to everybody. The best advice I ever got is don't take advice. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the record as saying that. If, you, if I took advice for half the things I do, I wouldn't have done half the things I've done. Okay, so, so advice comes with a pinch of salt is, is the point I'm, yeah. I'm making. Okay. But we intend to prove you wrong. Hey? I intend to prove you it's wrong. It's all good. <laughs> Look, I'll, yeah. I'll take 
Uh, well, I do have uh, the banking details verification system. It's something that I've actually... Say that again, slower. Banking details verification system. So basically what uh, the system intends to do is to verify banking details of clients that owe uh, institutions, uh, specifically financial institutions. Uh, verify cars. the banking details of clients that owe financial institutions. Yes. Carry on, you have my attention. Yeah. So <coughs> I made this presentation to, to FMB. And, well, uh, the banking details verification system intends to uh, verify those banking details for the people that owe these financial institutions in order to be able to uh, increase uh, the profits that are made by the financial institutions with an objective of, of meeting uh, their monthly uh, financial you know, uh, obligations or other you know, uh, objectives. What is the problem you're solving? Well, the problem is that... Uh, a lot of people run away from uh, paying their loans and uh, paying their debts. So this system uh, will ensure that uh, the banks have the correct banking details in place of the people who owe these financial institution, inst institutions money, but also just uh, linked to other financial institutions. I'll give an example. You have an, an FMB account. Um, you have a home loan with FMB. And now you can no longer afford to pay FMB. Instead of you having to come out honestly and say, I'm not in a financial position to pay this monthly installment, what you then therefore do, you change your banking details and you give them incorrect banking details. So what the system will be able to do is to be able to trace whether this uh, banking details that you provided to, to the institution, it is you know, the correct banking details. You can't do it. Or not? Yeah, because that would be in breach of the FICA Act. The only, the, by, by South African law, the only repository that's enabled, that's allowed to authenticate client banking details is the Financial Intelligence Center. You can't do it. Let me put it to you this way. If the banks could do it, the banks wouldn't need you. Why would I, a bank, having the bank account of a customer, need you to verify the bank account I have? Bank CEOs meet. You may or may not be aware of this. Every six weeks, there's a bank CEO meeting, standing. They meet every single six weeks to talk about the market. So bank CEOs can meet and go, you know, people keep moving my damn accounts to African Bank. And the African Bank CEO can go, okay, well, I'll give it to you. Yeah. The reason it doesn't happen is because in financial services, it's called a Chinese wall. The Chinese wall, it's like the wall of China. There's information sitting on this side that's not allowed to pass to information sitting on this side. Banks are not allowed to do it. The only central repository for financial, financial services information in the country is FICA. Only the Financial Intelligence Center, nobody else. Out in Klele Pans. Um, guys, I'm going to give you a quick tip. Just remember this. When you, when you, anytime you pitch something, please take the trouble to take people through the various steps of the thing you're pitching. So let me, let me tell you what that means. It's a bit like saying, I'm going to build a car. I love cars, so I'll, I'll, you'll notice I'll use them a lot as a reference. I'm going to build a car. It's going to be the fastest car on earth. It's also going to drive on Pirelli 3025s at the back, which are 21 inch mag. It's going to be built of carbon fiber. It's going to run on a combustion as well as electric engines. Each of the wheel is going to get their own electric power. Too many concepts. I'm going to build a car. It's going to be the fastest car on earth. It's going to have a six liter V12 naturally aspirated. Full stop. Yeah? Because what you do, remember you're working in the on the idea, right? Just don't forget this. You're working on the idea, and you know all the pieces that make this idea work. All the customer needs to know is the idea, not the pieces that make it work. Yeah. Certainly not an investor, not up front. So the minute you start getting into the pieces that make it work, you complicate it. I'm not quite sure how this water came to, ah, JMB, of course. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how this water came to be in this bottle. I'm sure there was a process where the water was found, went through a process of distillation. There was a plastic manufacturer who manufactured the plastic. There was a branding company that did the branding. And then they heard about the event. They took it, they put a, I, what do I need to know? Do I need water? 
Yes, how much? X amount, what's the cost? Boom. Second round, you can explain everything, the technical parts. That's why investors go through a process of due diligence. So I heard this idea, now help me understand this thing. Make sense? Okay, now that I've said that to you, let's go back, rewind like Ace Ventura, start again, just keep it very simple for me. Okay, so it's an app-based uh, platform um, where you can easily access a personal trainer or um, a fitness uh, person or person that offers a service in fitness and in health. Um, so what we basically do is you load the personal trainer on the platform um, and the person obviously then logs in and then um, you search for, so for instance, if you're trying to do legs, um, you're trying to do abs, you're trying to lose weight or build muscle while losing weight. So for people also that um, prepare for shows, so personal uh, bodybuilding shows, uh, if you're trying to get that, then you just basically type the, the keyword, which is, um, well, you, you just say you're training for, personal, uh, for a bodybuilding show, and then it'll show you all the people that are basically trainers that have been training uh, bodybuilders in your area, so you can search by area as well, um, in your area, and then you choose whether you want the person to come train you at your house, at a park, or um, a gym. So, and then it'll show you there, you're able to access the person's uh, profile as well to be able to see whether the person was vetted before that or not, um, what they've done before um, and what they do, what qualifications they have. Um, also, then you're able to see if the person has been used before, um, you'll be able to see their rating, the rating they've gotten previously and thus uh, determining what, what rate they can charge you. So all personal trainers that have basically train a lot of people, have gotten good rates, um, and have a lot of experience, can charge a much higher rate, so. What do you guys think is the question I'm gonna ask him? Yeah. Are you guys clear? Because I'm still not clear, so let's. <laughs> yeah. So what is the problem you're solving? So the problem is there's a lot of uh, personal trainers that, are, that have qualifications and have a lot of experience in the market, but can't reach the general market. Okay, so, so can't the problem you're market. solving, I'm gonna say it for you, is market access. Make sense? Yeah. That's important to keep in mind because when you, when you are building a platform, there are going to be times when you're going to have to make a decision, particularly from a, from a GUI, and, GUI perspective. You guys know what GUI is? Uh, graphic user interface. And when, when you get to that stage, you're going to have to make a decision about what, does, what kind of GUI do you use to facilitate market access. Because facilitating market access is different from providing verification. Those are different GUIs. Okay, yeah. carry on explaining the, the, the thing. Okay, so then from there... Um, so here's the first thing, sorry. So here's, maybe let's just jump in there. I see your hand is up and we still haven't started yet properly. But so here's the, here's the first thing I would do if I was you. So you've got to distinguish between a, a personal trainer and a fitness instructor, because those are not the same things, right? Yeah. Fitness instructor typically are tied to a particular brand yeah. and they're tied to a particular franchise and they're tied to a particular branch of a brand and a franchise. They work hours, they get paid a salary. Personal trainers have a process of education that they go through. Typically, they have a diploma in sports management or something of yeah. the sort, and they have customers that they have on their books, and they charge the customer rate per hour. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? The problem with many personal trainers, I'll tell you, having had a few, is the process of verif verification is rubbish. So if you meet one that's been around for two years and one that's been around for 20 years, you can't verify. Okay. You just don't know. I mean, they're fat personal trainers, which to me doesn't make sense. It's like the skinny guy, it's like the skinny guy in the gym telling you you're bench pressing wrong. Yeah, but look at you. <laughs> like you're skinny. How are you telling me I'm bench pressing wrong? Makes sense. You know what I mean? Makes sense. Right. So, so because you can't distinguish between the guy who just started and a CT Fletcher, you now don't know who you're getting. So the first thing I would do on your platform, if I was you, is I would have a process of verifying how many years the person has been in the trade. And based on the number of years the person has been in the trade, I would give them a seniority rating. I'd also make them more expensive. Here's why you want to do that. Because the guys who've been in the game the longest, have the highest amount of experience, are in most demand. And if you put them on your platform, customers will come. Yeah? Cool. It's clever, eh? So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I'd reach a standard rate to charge, which is usually controversial. I want to tell you now your problem is going to be disintermediation, but I'll explain that in a minute. So the second thing I'll do is I'll get a standard rate to charge. So I'd have a five-star tiering system or whatever 
for a person who's one star, is the cost is X, person who's two star, cost is Y, da -da 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 -da, until I get to the five star who's the most expensive and this person costs within this range. Okay? But the real problem you're going to have is going to be disintermediation, and here's what that means. Someone's going to find me on the platform, book once. Then I'm going to give them my number. The next time they want me, they're going to phone me directly. Your platform's going to lose money. In Kosa, I am what they call Kalekel. Kalekel is what I am. Right? So that's, so that's what I would do. And then the third, which I think is, would probably be a biggest problem, is so how do you convince the consumer that the platform is where they want to go to find the personal trainer or the fitness instructor? And the only way to do that, uh, there's an expression in online marketing, which is that offline drives online. How do you get something to trend on Twitter? Do something stupid in the real world. Offline drives online. Make sense? So it's actually counterintuitive, but the way to do it is you're going to have to do a series of activations in the real world, and then people will come and use the platform on the actual platform. Offline always drives online.